Hello, my name is David Richards. I'm director of the Margaret Shea Smith Library located in Skowhegan, Maine. I'm doing this presentation as part of the University of Maine Impact Week. Uh, throughout the week, we are doing different programs to highlight uh, the activities of the library and our connections to the University of Maine. And what I'm going to be trying to do today is give you a virtual tour of the facility. Because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to have people visit since early March. So over the summer we worked on trying to create content that people could access through our website. In a moment, I'll walk you through that site to show you what's available and also provide some commentary and a bit of a tour along the way. Now, when I'm giving a tour here at the library, I always like to start out by talking about Margaret Chase Smith using one specific item, which is the cardboard cutout of her you see over my right shoulder. I uh, always like to start off with young Margaret because the impression, the lasting impression that most people have Margaret is the one you see over my left shoulder. I'm the older Margaret, uh, the one who is a successful politician. And the photo you see here is from the mid 1960s when Margaret Chase Smith is at a Washington Senators baseball game as they're playing the New York Yankees in 1965. And again, to give you an idea of the stature that she had attained, she's actually sitting next to the President of the United States. It's opening day in April. I believe it was the 1965 season. Uh, again, that's the impression that most people have of Margaret Chase Smith, but um, I like to start off with young Margaret. And one reason for that is because of her stature. Uh, this is four foot, 10 inch Margaret J. Smith. Uh, she, as an adult, was only about five foot three, uh, actually more like five foot two, but she usually wore high heels to eke out another inch. And especially with young people, it shows them that it's not about what's on the outside, it's about what's on the inside in terms of what you can accomplish in life. It's not about physical stature, it's about the determination that you have. And that's another element of what is revealed by this image of Margaret. Uh, it looks like she's wearing a dress. I can lean out of the way a little bit more. Uh, but what it really is, is a bathing suit. Uh, this is a scene from 1910 where she's standing on a dock at North Pond, which is part of the Belgrade Lakes. That's where her family would go to go swimming in the summertime. And it shows you that the times in which she grew up were much different. Uh, that when, when women went out swimming at that time, they were expected to stay covered up. And so it was a very different era. Uh, Margaret was born here in Skowhegan to a classic, into a classic New England mill town, to a family that didn't have very much money. And as is revealed by this photo, she was growing up at a time in which uh, the mores were much different for women. The expectations were much different. And one of the big examples of that is that as she is growing up as a young girl in Skowhegan during the 19 teens, uh, women still don't have the right to vote. That's not going to come until 1920 when the 19th Amendment is ratified to the Constitution. So it makes all the more extraordinary as you make that leap from the black and white Margaret to the in color Margaret, sort of our Wizard of Oz moment, uh, all the new rights and opportunities that come along as women gain the right to vote. And Margaret is really one of the first women who is able to make use of this uh, to the extent of being able to make politics a career. So that's how I would usually start out people is just giving that introduction to Margaret J. Smith. And now what we're going to do is share the screen and we're going to start taking this virtual field trip. And the way you can ac access it is just go to our website, uh, www.mcslibrary.org, and you can go to a page called Virtual Field Trip and Lesson Plan. And that is uh, up here on the top banner, or actually on our opening page. Uh, on the top banner, it's in the middle row, right in the middle. And as you work your way down, the first section is called Virtual Field Trip. And the first item is actually a video. Uh, it is one 
that was done as a documentary by Patsy Wiggins when she was working for WCSH TV down in Portland. It was an hour long presentation that was shown on Channel 6. And it was liked so well that what we did here at the libraries had her cut it down to about 20 minutes so that we could use it as an introductory video to introduce people to Margaret Chase Smith's life and career. Uh, so that's something that you can watch on your own. Um, the next item is called Margaret Chase Smith Library Virtual Field Trip, which is where we've tried to bring a lot of different items together. In a way, this could become a whole field trip unto itself. Uh, the opening page, if you click on the screen, the television screen, it actually takes you to that video I was uh, just showing you. Uh, next on the podium is some roses. And uh, that is something that became very associated with Margaret Chase Smith. When she went in the United States Senate in 1949, she would almost always wear a rose in her lapel. So it was very much part of her public persona. Uh, so that when she ran for president in 1964, one of her campaign buttons was a picture of a rose with her name underneath. And people just knew that those two things were linked. And it even went to the extent of her proposing that the rose should be the national flower. And elsewhere in the room, you can click on one of her pet dogs. She liked chihuahuas, which in her day were referred to as Mexican hairless. She had a couple of those uh, during her life. And then you can click right on Margaret, and that will take you to biographical information about her. So that's the, the introduction with the video. And the, this is the meeting room where people would usually congregate. You can see we've Got the chairs spaced out in an appropriate socially distanced manner to accommodate uh, the pandemic. Uh, the next section is to give you a sense of the museum, which is set up as a timeline exhibit. So it begins in 1897 and it goes around to 1995, filled with memorabilia and photographs highlighting her, her career. We could by no means replicate all of that online, so I've just hit some of the highlights. And the first one is her famous moment in her career, probably the moment that will keep her in the history books for a long time. And that is in early 1950, uh, after World War II is over, and we're come into the midst of the Cold War, this rivalry that we have with the Soviet Union, uh, that becomes a concern that um, Communism is on the march throughout the world, trying to take over the world. In 1949, two things occurred that scared us. One is the Soviet Union exploded an atomic bomb, and the second was China fell to the communists. So you now have these two large countries in Asia um, that have both fallen to the communists. And the politician who seizes upon that is Joseph McCarthy senator from Wisconsin, who starts going around the country in February 1950 saying that the reason these two events have happened is because there are communists in our government and there are communists and communist sympathizers in American society and places like high school teaching and colleges and universities and our school systems and, and labor unions and out in Hollywood, and they're undermining the American way of life. Uh, Margaret Chase Smith was very concerned, but um, anytime you went to see this evidence that Joe McCarthy said he had, uh, it was just lots of gossip and rumor and innuendo. And she wasn't very much a fan of the tactics that he would use, which was to really browbeat people and to trample on their civil liberties. And she felt something needed to be done. So she got up on the floor of the Senate on June 1st, 1950 and gave what was called the Declaration of Conscience speech. She never mentioned Joe McCarthy by name. She never personalized it. But by criticizing the tactics he was using, it was very clear who she was speaking out against. It caused a great sensation the next day all across the country. Newspapers are talking about the speech in banner headlines. And in the days to come, uh, people start to speculate that she might be a vice presidential or presidential candidate in the next election cycle in 1952. So this is really the moment that put her on the national stage and she stayed on there for the next two decades. Her approach to trying to understand communism, and actually um, what you can hear in this Declaration of Conscience section is actually her reading the declaration um, many years after she originally gave it. There was no re recording in the Senate as she gave it at that time. Uh, the next section is about 
a very famous world trip that she took in 1954 and 1955, when she visited 23 countries. Her approach to trying to understand the spread of communism throughout the world after World War II is to go visit countries and see why in Europe people were voting in democratic elections for communists in places like Italy and France. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with the eternal uh, turmoil, the economic and social turmoil, which translated into political turmoil after World War II, as those countries had been devastated by the war. So one of the things that he came to realize from her world tours was that the United States need to play more of a, a role in helping rebuild Europe, which became known as the Marshall Plan. Um, so you see her seated in front of a picture that is showing you the route that she took. Um, you see some lines on the map. Uh, there was two legs of the tour. Uh, she had to come back to the United States in the middle of her trip. Uh, so the first leg was to Europe in the Middle East, and the second leg was to Asia. And there, again, is a link that you can go to to learn more about that trip. And then we move up to 1956. And you see an image of her with Eleanor Roosevelt. And this was an appearance that they both had on the CBS Sunday morning news program called Face the Nation. And this was in November of 1956, right before the presidential election that year between Dwight Eisenhower and Adlai Stevenson. And so Eleanor Roosevelt is on to support the Democratic candidate, Adlai Stevenson, and Margaret Chase Smith is on to support President Eisenhower. It's a very interesting debate that they have. There's a clip that you can watch down below. And what comes out of it is that you see that Margaret Chase Smith understands this new medium of television much better than Eleanor Roosevelt. So I'll let you watch that and see what you can glean in the distinction between the two people. Uh, moving on in the timeline, we move up to 1957, which was another pivotal year in the Cold War. That's the year that the Soviet Union put the first satellite in space, Sputnik, which startled us because we had looked at them as being a backward technological country and had concluded they got atomic technology by stealing it from us. But they didn't steal satellite technology because they were able to put a satellite into space before the United States was. Uh, so Margaret Chase Smith, um, her approach was always to go out and find out why things were happening. And she's in 1957 made a tour of defense and military installations to see what the state of our aeronautical and space program was. And along the way, uh, she wore this flight suit because she wanted to break the sound barrier and she was able to get a defense contractor, North American Aviation, to take her up and fly in an F-100F Super Sabre jet and break the sound barrier in 1957. The other thing that happens in that year is the United States Senate decides they need to have a special committee that's going to oversee the space program. And Margaret gets appointed to that. So she's right there as the pro space program begins. Uh, first program was Project Mercury, very simple missions, seven astronauts chosen. Alan Shepard goes up, he comes down. John Wen goes up over the Earth four times, comes back home. And then we moved on to Project Gemini, where two manned missions, and then uh, the Apollo program in the 1960s, which was to put a man on the moon. Those were three man missions. And uh, she was even there long enough that she was there for the start of planning for the space shuttle program, which actually became before the Aeronautical and Space Sciences Committee in 1965, even though uh, space well, it would take another 17 years before the first space shuttle flew in 1982. Uh, Margaret was also proud of other ways that, and you can learn more about uh, her flight uh, with this link about Margaret getting inducted into the Mark Busters Club. Uh, sound is measured in units called Mark and because they broke the speed of sound on the flight, uh, she got that citation. Uh, Margaret was proud of the role that Maine was able to pl play in the space program. And one of the ways was uh, one of our counters to Sputnik was uh, a satellite called Telstar, which was launched in the early 1960s. And it was the first commercial communication satellite. And what that enabled was us to send beams via uh, sending stations up 
connects to satellites that would then come down to receiving stations. And those stations were located in France, England, and Andover, Maine. And that's what Margaret is pointing to in the picture, the radar dome located in Andover, Maine, that was uh, known as Telstar. Uh, Margaret ran for president of the United States in 1964. And you can click on a link here where you're gonna see her giving her announcement uh, to the National Women's Press Club. And it's a very interesting way in that she makes the announcement. Basically, she lists all the reasons people have told her not to run. And then she's gonna to come to a very surprising conclusion. And I don't wanna give that away. Uh, so you can go on and look at that clip. So now we're gonna move from the museum, which you've just seen six items out of literally dozens, scores, hundreds that are in the museum. And we're gonna go transition to the house. And you access that by clicking on the roof as a link. It takes you to a Google site. And what you need to do, first of all, to let you know that the library is built as an addition onto her, her house. House was built in 1948. The addition was added on in 1982. And to access the house, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner, uh, there is an icon that says the center's home, and then down below there's a drop box. And the drop box will walk you through different sections of the house. The first section is called setting. And that is Neil Hill in Skowhegan. And you have a photograph here from 1948. Uh, this is from June of 1948. There's a photo that appeared in Parade Magazine uh, talking about the fact that Margaret's going to be running for the United States Senate. And she's standing on Neil Hill, looking out over the Kennebec River and deciding if this is where she wants to have her new home situated. And she decides, yes, indeed, that is the case. Uh, and you can see. Behind her is that's essentially downtown Skowhegan, which is along the banks of the Kennebec River. Kennebec River being the lifeblood of Skowhegan. Like I said, this is a classic New England mill town. You have this mighty river that provides a lot of water power. There's a natural waterfall here in Skowhegan, and then they built dams to raise the water level to create more water power. So there were lots of sawmills, lumber mills, bolt mills here in Skowhegan. Uh, and it, actually, if you look closely in the photo, you will note that you can see the booms stretching across the river catch the logs. Those are logs, uh, pulp logs uh, in the river. Uh, so the, some of the logs, all the logs, would have started up at uh, Moosehead Lake. And in the springtime when the water was high, they'd run them down the river and they'd cut them out along the way for different mills. And some of the logs, here in Skowhegan would stay in town, but some needed to go further downriver to uh, Waterville and Winslow, and as far down as Augusta and Gardner, where there were mills as well. So Kennebec was actually the last river in Maine where they did log drives, the last one being in 1976. So this is what the house looked like when it was first built. Uh, as I say, that was uh, 1948, and my recollection is the first meal she ever had was Christmas dinner in 1948 and then really moved in in 1949. Uh, so it has two wings and then you'll have this central area right here that's an, an inset and indent uh, where the front door was located. You don't see it from this angle. And then uh, for the far left, you can see a garage door. And what happened in 1982 is that entryway was created into a sunroom. And it's one of the places that Margaret Chase Smith liked to spend a lot of time in her retirement because it was so warm out there. But also because directly across from her favorite chair, which was this one right outside the door, was a big plate glass window. And so she knew people could see her. And so many people in this area tell us that's their memory of Margaret Chase Smith maybe driving up and down Norwich Walk Avenue and see Margaret Chase Smith seated in the atrium. So you can get a more formal tour from our museum assistant, uh, John Taylor, who will walk and talk you through. Uh, I am going to continue on my way and welcome you now inside the house. Margaret designed the house herself. Here you see some of the original plans. 
the idea came to her as she was traveling. So you see, she just grabbed some stationery that was available from American Airlines and Congress of the United States. And another drawing is on the back of some hotel stationery. She took the plans to an architect down in Auburn, Maine, named Alonzo Harriman, who did the more formal plans that the builders used. Um, this chart right here is the color chart for the eight different rooms. You can see each room has a different color. It's the color scheme that we maintain today. So you originally would have come into the house. You wouldn't sort of your first view of the house wouldn't have been an atrium. That would just would have been the outdoor. So your first view would have been an entry room, right inside the front door. And again, John Taylor will walk and talk you through that. And then behind that is the living room. One of the items that is in the entry room and also in the living room and also in her bedroom is this family photograph. Uh, so it gives you a good indication of how important her family was to her. It was taken in November of 1942. So by this point, her husband isn't alive. That's why her husband Clyde is not in the picture. But Margaret's right here. You can see one of her chihuahuas, her mother Carrie, father George, her sister Evelyn, her sister Laura, their husbands back here in the back row, her brother Wilbur. She had two other brothers, but they died young. And then Wilbur's wife, and then one, two, three, four, five young people, which were her nieces and nephews. Clyde and Margaret never had any children when they were married. And so Margaret became very close to her nieces and nephews. And from this entry room, you head into the living room, which is really how the house is designed around a very large living room with lots of um, large windows so that you have good views outside. Uh, and then on either side of the large living room are two wings, one for her and one for her guests. And John will walk and talk you through the living room. Uh, one element of the living room was that um, she had a dining room table in it up against one of the windows. And essentially, the view out the window is from her, her living room slash dining room is the view that she was had when she was standing on Neil Hill before the house was built. So that's uh, Skowhegan in the background, the town of Skowhegan, the business district, commercial district, the manufacturing district, right along the banks of the river. <coughs> So now we'll move on to the next section, which is the guest wings of the house. And uh, on the guest side, we highlight one very famous guest that she had in 1955, which was President Dwight Eisenhower. He came to Maine to go fishing up at the Rangeley Lakes. And so they arranged for him to give a speech at the fairgrounds, which is what you see on the left. And on the right, Senator Smith invited the president, his entourage, the press corps, and some other VIPs do a steak and lobster dinner on her back lawn. So if I move myself out of the way, you get a better view. There's Senator Smith in a dark blue, navy blue dress, sitting right next to President Eisenhower in his brown suit. And they, you can see they're inspecting the food as it's being cooked. On the other side is uh, Governor Edmund Muskie. And President Eisenhower was feeling a bit tired in the afternoon, so Senator Smith invited him into the house to take a nap in one of the guest bedrooms, and thereafter she always referred to this as the Eisenhower room, and uh, John will explain that to you. It actually is a room that she had more set up as a tribute to her husband Clyde over the side of John's right shoulder is a picture of Clyde, and then you see Margaret is in a portrait hanging on the wall right next to the photo of Clyde and the bed in the room is the one that they shared as a married couple. There's another guest bedroom on that side of the house which you see depicted here and then in 1955-1956 um, she had an addition added on to the guest side of the house which created a sitting room and a bathroom so it gave a little more space to her guests when they came to visit. Then the next section of the house is Margaret's wing which has a bedroom, a bathroom, and the kitchen. And the top photo, you see the bedroom. John down below, you can click on the arrow and he'll give you a description of some of the highlights of that room. Uh, you see, uh, as you look on the walls, um, starting from the left, a series of flower paintings. Those are 
given to her by Madame Chiang Kai-shek, uh, the wife of the leader of nationalist China, which uses the Chinese Re revolution in 1949 to Mao Zedong and uh, gets driven off to the island of Taiwan. Margaret J. Smith was very friendly with Madame Chiang Kai-shek. And then over her bed is a painting of uh, her mother, Carrie. When people would ask Margaret Chase Smith how she was able to accomplish all the things that she did in her life, she would often give the credit to her mother, Carrie, who taught her to be a very determined person. And then uh, moving farther to the right, you see pictures of her family. Um, actually, it's cut off a little bit, but that's the family photo. And then pictures of her with her parents, uh, and in particular with her mother, Carrie, a couple more of those photos. And then you have the kitchen, which is right off of the, the bedroom. And it's very tiny. That was purposeful. Margaret believed there really ought to be only one person in the kitchen to cook and everyone else should keep out. If she was alone, she could just dine right at the counter. If she had guests, you saw that dining room table that was kept in the living room. And she had leaves for it as well, so they could always pull it out into the middle of the room and accommodate more people. Margaret was a, a very powerful woman. She's a United States Senator. She's being considered for a vice presidential or presidential candidate. She runs for president in 1964. She has very strong views on the Cold War, very much involved in the space program. And yeah, uh, the public perception of her often is more uh, domestic and feminine. And she just understood that she had to walk that line that there were certain prescribed roles for women during the 1950s and 60s. And that's really highlighted by this article from Ladies Home Journal in November of 1956. So at the same time that she's appearing on Face the Nation, talking about an upcoming presidential election, uh, the approach that Ladies Home Journal takes, as you can see from the photos, is as a woman who does needlework, who keeps a kitchen, who sets a table, and who polishes silver. And that concludes the house portion of the tour. And now I'll just show you that, well, you don't actually need to go back into it again, but as you go from the web page, you can just go straight to the house. You don't do the, need to do the whole virtual field trip and cuts straight to the house if you want. And then another section is on museum exhibits. In addition to the timeline exhibit for the museum, we have uh, temporary exhibits that we do every year. So these are some of the ones we've done in recent years. The current one in connection to the Maine Bicentennial is by virtue of Maine becoming a state in 1820 and means that Maine then got have United States senators. So we highlight each of the senators Maine has had since 1820. You see two here, Margaret Chase Smith and Edmund Muskie from 1960, photo from 1967. Last year, in 2019, we highlighted the centennial of the 19th Amendment, which was actually not ratified until fully until 1920, but the work was definitely going on to try to forward it uh, during the 19-teens. Margaret really wasn't a suffragette. She was a little too young to be involved with that movement. She was definitely a beneficiary in that she's really one of the first women in this country who was able to take that new right of voting and turn it into a political career. But interestingly, her, her mother, Carrie, I wouldn't say she was a suffragette, but she definitely was someone who actively sought for women to get the right to vote in that she signed petitions um, when Maine had referendums to vote on the issue. She signed petitions encouraging men to vote yes on the issue. Uh, you got to remember that women wouldn't have been allowed to vote, so they had to beseech the men to vote for, it, which they did not in Maine. Uh, it only comes by virtue of the federal amendment that women get the right to vote here in Maine. Uh, we had another recent exhibit about Margaret's connections to the media, being a politician, a lot of media interest in her, particularly since she's a woman. She's perceived to have this different point of view, which is why she gets in Ladies Home Journal, and which is why she's on the face of the nation uh, with Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, but interestingly, she also had somewhat of a background in the media in that one of her jobs in Skowhegan was she worked for a newspaper called The Independent Reporter, and she started out 
with clerical work, but they let her rise up through the ranks over the years to the point where she actually wrote some articles herself. And we have another exhibit that we did a couple of years ago about Margaret's connections to Hollywood, Power Loves Power. So politicians and actors are quite often connected. And here is a photo from an award ceremony in 1955 when uh, Margaret Chase Smith is with actors Danny Kaye and Jimmy Stewart. And actually, she was receiving an award um, for reports that she had filed for CBS News when she was on her world trip in 1954 and 1955. Some of her reports were shown on a television program called See It Now, which was hosted by one of the most famous journalists of the day, Edward R. Murrow. And we did another exhibit on Margaret's teen years growing up in Skowhegan. And we did one on her connection to her husband, Clyde, who was a very interesting man in his own right. Uh, he had been married once before. He was 20 years older than Margaret Chase Smith. He was a consummate politician. He's one of these guys who rises up from the rank, um, almost from dog catcher right up to United States House of Representatives. But the real job he wanted to hold was governor of the state of Maine, but the Republican Party told him in 1936 they needed him to run for the House of Representatives, and so that's what he wound up doing, and he was successful. This picture is from 1938 at a time when Clyde would have been serving in Congress, and he had Margaret serve as his secretary, so she was very familiar with the issues of the day, uh, the approach of the war. Um, war is already going on in Europe and uh, the Spanish Civil War. Uh, Hitler's come to power in Germany and is starting to invade some of his neighbors. And the other big issues are the ones connected to the New Deal. And Clyde was very much someone who was a proponent of pen a pension program, which eventually is going to become the Social Security program. So Margaret's learning all those lessons um, as she's serving as the secretary in his office which can become important because he passes away in 1940. And that's how Margaret first gets to be in the House of Representatives, succeeding her husband, Clyde, and then winning election on her own four times. Uh, and then eventually in 1964, she's gonna to decide to run for president of the United States. Uh, she's running as a Republican in that year. It's a very wide field. There was about eight or nine candidates altogether. She winds up coming in second on the final ballot. And it's significant because it's the first time that a woman has ever been even placed in nomination by one of the two major parties, in her case, the Republican Party. So those are exhibits. And then the next section is a list of educational programs, which is probably mostly something that would be of interest to teachers. And then there's another section on lesson plans, which again is more designed for teachers. That is sort of the, the educational component of the field trip. And we'll go back to the Google version of the field trip in that you will also then be able to access the archives. Um, this slide, slide number five. And what you're seeing here is a space that originally was a breezeway in a garage. And in 1982, when they built the library, they converted that space into a research room. You see all the black file cabinets. This is where Senator Smith's papers came to be located as they were moved back from Washington, D.C., so about 300,000 documents altogether. Um, correspondence that she had with fellow members of Congress, members of the executive branch, and a lot of constituent correspondence, letters that people here in Maine wrote to her and her responses back to them. That was something she really focused on in her political career, so there's lots of those documents. And Mark, uh, our librarian here, Angie Stockwell, is holding a scrapbook. That's another big part of the collection. We have over 500 of those, which started out as family scrapbooks, and then she just had her staff keep them throughout the years. I'm gonna let Angie tell you the whole story of the archives and her role and her work. You see there's this link right here, which you can go to. It's uh, 
quite an extensive presentation that she gives. Uh, you see in this photo, she's going to be talking about one of the scrapbooks. I think this is a pretty noteworthy one, volume 341. There's going to be something in there that she's going to tell you. She's going to talk to you about this portrait on the wall behind her, which is her favorite portrait of Margaret Chase Smith. And the reason it's her favorite is you have to understand Angie's connection to the library. It started out that, that she was Senator Smith's personal secretary and she was hired in 1983. So I always joke that she probably created a quarter of the items in the collection. Uh, any correspondence that Senator Smith did after she uh, left Washington, D.C. Uh, from that period from uh, 1983 to she passed away in 1995, uh, Angie would have been taking the dictation and typing up the letters. Um, but when Senator Smith died, she then transitioned to becoming the librarian. And she's you know, still here um, for another week. She's actually going to be retiring during Maine Impact Week. Her last day is September 30th. Uh, that's after being here for 37 and a half years. And so she has a very intimate connection uh, to the collection and with Senator Smith as well. And again, she'll tell you in this video presentation why that portrait of Margaret Chase Smith is so meaningful to her. Um, so that concludes the tour component. You've seen some elements from the museum. You've seen some uh, elements of the house. You can go back and watch the videos of John Taylor telling you more about items in the house. And then you have that video of uh, Mrs. Stockwell talking about the archives that you can watch and also the introductory video by Patsy Wiggins. And so I wanted to conclude by coming back on. So I'm going to stop sharing and talk about a couple of items. And I want to bring it back to Margaret Chase Smith. You can get these two images behind me. And the final message, especially for young people that I like to have is what Margaret Chase Smith really wanted people coming away from. It's not so much from a visit remembering all the history about Margaret Chase Smith. There's books where you could access that history. Um, there's a couple of lessons that she, people, she wanted people to draw from being here. And one connects to an item that is in the entry room of her house. Uh, as you walk into that room, there's a very nice portrait of Margaret Shea Smith. Right underneath the portrait, there's a book. And it's this book right here, the little engine that could. And it's in a very prominent spot, as I mentioned, right underneath her portrait in the first room of her house. There's thousands of books that she could have selected to be there, some of which she wrote. She wrote her own political autobiography. But that's not what she put on out on display in that very prominent spot in the first place uh, in her in her in the first room of her house. She put this book, and I think it's because she understood that this is something that even kids would understand the message of this book, the little engine that could, uh, the part in the towards the end of the story where the engine's trying to get up over the hill, and it tells itself, "I think I can, I think I can, I think I can." One of the lessons that Margaret Chase Smith wanted to pass on, especially to young people in Maine, was the importance of having aspirations. She hated it when kids from Maine set their sights low and thought just because they were from Maine and from certain parts of Maine that opportunities wouldn't be open to them. She wanted them to look at the example of her own life and say someone born in a classic New England mill town to a family that didn't have a lot of money at the time when women didn't have a lot of opportunities. But she didn't let any of those things hold her back, any of those obstacles. And she didn't want young kids here in Maine holding themselves back. And she knew they would know this story and that to have successful aspirations, you also have to have determination. You have to be the type of people who say they think they can. So she wanted young people and all people to have aspirations, goals, and dreams to make something of their lives. But she realized that life was more than just about yourself. It's about what you do for other people. And the object that I always like to point out in the museum timeline exhibit is this citation, this plaque 
that she received from the Salvation Army uh, with just the one word on it, others. And to Margaret Chase Smith, that's what service was all about. That's what her connection to public service was, her ability to help other people. Uh, as I say, one of the things that she really focused on when she was in Congress was what's known as constituent service. When your constituents had a problem and they came to your office or phoned you or sent you a letter to make sure that they got a very prompt follow up and hopefully a resolution to the problem that they were having. Something she was very noted for. She also understood that service is more than just serving in government or serving in the military. That there are many other ways that we can help out. And she was a very strong advocate of community service as well. So those are the two messages that we really like to make sure that people come away from visiting the library with that they think about what their goals and dreams are and how they can help other people along the way. So uh, that's the first attempt at a virtual field trip, a virtual tour of the facility. It by no means replicates what you could do in person. Uh, we actually do now have approval to have people visit um, by reservation. And so if you're interested in that opportunity, you can call the library at 474-7133, or you can email the library at mcsl at mcslibrary.org. And we hope that uh, you will take advantage of that opportunity. And we are hopeful that the day will come when the pandemic has passed and you'll freely be able to come to the library. Our hours are Mondays through Fridays, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we also hope that you'll take advantage of some of the other presentations that we're doing as part of Maine Impact Week. There's one on what Margaret Chase Smith's connections to the University of Maine were over the years. Uh, we have a couple of interviews with students who have received Margaret Chase Smith scholarships at the University of Maine and are doing research um, about either public policy or historical research, in some cases about Margaret Chase Smith. And then we also have another video about a program that we run in conjunction, conjunction with the University of Maine uh, called National History Day in Maine, which is for sixth through 12th grade students. So I thank you for your attention and I bid you goodbye.